Okay, so good afternoon everyone and welcome to this lesson. Before starting with the new topic, we received some, some questions about the heuristic evaluation and about how to apply it in assignment five uh, that will be on Friday, right? Um, so first of all, you are going to test to assess a medium fidelity prototype uh, that it's clearly different from a final product. Uh, so hopefully you will find fewer errors with respect to the analysis that we have performed on the Trenitalia website last week. Um, because, for example, uh, in a medium fidelity prototype you don't have all the characteristics, all the elements of a final product. You don't have colors, you don't have images, and so you will probably find uh, a, f uh, a smaller set of, of errors. Um, of usability problems, but still uh, you will probably find some, some problems. Um, so I think there is, there is no risk of producing an empty report. Uh, and also remember that you have this, uh, uh, this uh, score through which you can rate uh, the priority of, of the problem. Uh, so maybe some problems will be just a suggestion on how to improve a given part of, of the prototype, right? So maybe there is the feedback on the medium fidelity prototype, but you identified a better way of providing this feedback. It's, it will be probably a low priority uh, problem, a cosmetic problem, uh, because the user can still interact and can still receive a feedback from the prototype, uh, but still this will be a suggestion for the other group to improve uh, their design, okay? So again, some heuristics will apply only minimally to medium fidelity prototypes, uh, but you will probably be able to find some, some problems and some improvements to be suggested to the other group, okay? Any questions on assignment five in general and on heuristic evaluation? Okay. So we can start with the new topic that is probably the last topic of this course. You will have some additional lectures, but this is actually the last topic that is covered in your uh, project work, so for the exam, okay? Um, and it's usability testing. So we started last week with uh, uh, a general introduction to evaluation that then we have seen uh, heuristic evaluation that is again experts checking a design applying some kind of heuristics some kind of principles and today we are going to cover um, evaluation that involves uh, the target population and in particular we will focus on this specific method that is uh, heuristic uh, usability testing sorry And this will also part of assignment six, okay? So in, in the assignment six, you will have to um, produce, to implement the high fidelity prototype of your project. And this will be, uh, I think, a long but easy step. You will need to simply translate your medium fidelity prototype into something more, more real, right? Uh, and then we'll probably ask you to test this high fidelity prototype with uh, your target population. So, uh, as you performed in the need finding phase, you will recruit some, some people, some participants from your target population and you will ask them to try your uh, prototype, your high fidelity prototype, uh, by applying this specific method that is usability testing. So, also in this case we will have two theoretical lessons today and tomorrow uh, and then next week on Monday we will we will conduct an exercise about planning a usability test that is probably the most difficult and important part of this uh, kind of technique. So the planning phase is, uh, um, is a phase that you need to conduct very carefully before running the test and you will plan your usability study in assignment six. Just to recap uh, what is evaluation in XCI it's uh, a set of techniques that you can use to test 
three things, mainly usability, functionality, and acceptability of an interactive system. And the main point of the last lessons was that the idea is to identify and correct problems as soon as possible. And this is the reason why you don't have typically a single evaluation in your design process, but you conduct multiple evaluations and different evaluations according to the design stage. For example, heuristic evaluations performed by experts is typically conducted at the beginning of the design process to solve the easy to solve problems before moving to tests that involve your target populations. And you can obviously test different dimensions of these three aspects. Uh, and obviously, as the name suggests, usability testing is again mainly focused on the usability, the usability aspect. So the goal is always to find usability problems and way to improve them and solve them. Um, okay. And these slides uh, summarizes the different evaluation approaches that we can have in HCI. Uh, we have already seen these distinctions in the previous lectures. The first main distinction is about the place in which the evaluation is conducted. So you can have evaluations in the lab and evaluations in the field. Uh, and then here are three main uh, categories of uh, approaches. Um, in the previous lessons, again, we focused on expert evaluation and in particular on two classical methods here that are cognitive walkthrough and heuristic evaluation. Today we are going to uh, talk about uh, evaluations that involve users uh, and in particular we will focus on experimental methods. But as I said in the previous lessons, you can also use observational and query methods like interviews, diary studies, focus groups. So something that you have used in the neat finding process, you can also use these techniques uh, as evaluations of your, of your systems, of your prototype. And these evaluations involve users, of course. And finally, there are automated evaluations that are very specific. They typically uh, focus on the code of your, of your product. Uh, there is some simulation and some uh, that try to extract some software measures. Uh, you can apply some formal evaluation techniques with mathematical models and formulas. For example, uh, you can also test accessibility of a, of a design. I think that you have already uh, seen the uh, guidelines for accessibility, the WACCG guidelines, I think. Uh, you can also have some software that automatically tests your system against these guidelines um, automatically by running a simulation of your, of your software. And this is something very specific that we are not going to cover in, in this course. So first distinction, expert versus users, uh, and pros and cons of the two approaches. Um, as, we had, as we have learned previously, expert methods like heuristic evaluation are typically faster, right? So a typical um, heuristic evaluation lasts about one, two hours per participant, per expert, uh, while user studies are typically longer. Uh, because you need to develop some software, you need to have at least uh, a prototype of your system, and in particular, you need to prepare the setup. Again, the planning phase of uh, usability testing, for example, is the most important part, and it's also a time-consuming uh, activity. Instead, on the contrary, uh, with an heuristic evaluation, you simply give your system to the expert and the expert check the uh, heuristics, right? So it's, it's faster. Um, and what about the results? Uh, results of an expert method are pre-interpreted by the evaluators. And so there is this risk of generating false positives and missing some problems by the experts. By definition, instead, the results that you can extract from a user study uh, are typically more accurate because you have your actual users that are trying your actual systems. And again, uh, you should use this kind of evaluations. Uh, you should alternate this kind of evaluations in your design process. 
and expert methods are useful for filtering and refining the design and the beginning of the design process, um, while user studies tend to occur in the later stages of, of development. So your final evaluation, maybe in the wild, in the field, will be probably, will be surely with your target population, of course. And for user studies, also in this case, you can adopt this technique uh, in different design stages. So for example, you can have a simulation of the interactive cap capability of your system at the beginning, uh, for example, by exploiting the Wizard of Odds technique. You can have a user test of a prototype, like in assignment six, you will test uh, a high fidelity prototype. And you can have, again, uh, a user test, uh, a final user test with a full implemented system with all its, its functionality. Then also for user testing, uh, there can be this distinction between lab and field. So the place in which you conduct your test with your target population. Um, so from now on, we focus on uh, target users. And if you involve target users in the lab, you have some, uh, also in this case, advantages and disadvantages. Um, as we have seen previously, the advantages of an in-the-lab uh, test is that you can simulate also complex contexts, uh, and this is especially useful for uh, complex and dangerous domains like medical, aerospace, and so on. And you can also test your system in uh, an uninterrupted environment, right? So there is the user that is in the lab and can ex exclusively, sorry, focus on the task without being interrupted by external notifications, by something that can happen in the real world. So you have this kind of uninterrupted environment. Um, you have also disadvantages, of course. There is this lack of context. The context is just simulated. Um, and so you, you can miss the real context. And there is this unnatural situations in which during which the user knows that is in the lab and there is someone observing the user. And this is a, an unnatural situation that may introduce some biases in your results. And also in the lab, it's difficult to observe several users cooperating. So as we will see later in this, in this lecture, um, an in the lab study, uh, a user study in the lab, is performed typically one user at a time, one, par one participant at a time. So you have your first participant that performed the test, then the test is finished, and you start with the second participant that will conduct, that will experience the very same session. Okay? So it's difficult to, uh, to have multiple peoples, people interacting with your, with your system in the lab. So, Lab studies are appropriate for dangerous environments and domains, and if you have to test uh, specific tasks on your, on your system. In the field, you have the advantage of having the natural environment of the user, uh, so you have the full context. Um, and you can also uh, perform longitudinal studies uh, in the field. But on the other end, uh, there is also the possibility of having some distractions and noise, right? Because the user is in his real context. Maybe the smartphone on the, of the participant stopped working after two days, and so you cannot extract more data from your participants. So there can be distractions and, and noise. And these kind of studies are uh, surely more, more difficult to be conducted. So, conduct an in-the-field study if the context is crucial uh, and for longitudinal studies and typically the, the last evaluation of the design process is an in-the-field in the study during which you ask your participants to download and install your application and try it for a month, for example. So this is a, an example taken from this, uh, this year. Uh, so this is a... Um, uh, low fidelity prototype of my slot, so uh, related to the digital will be in topic. I don't know, are the members of this group here in the classroom? I don't think so, no. I can try to summarize this. It's just an example, of course. 
uh, this mobile application in this case. Um, and this example is to show you that you can study different things depending on the evaluation that you are, yeah, you are adopting. So this is a mobile app uh, that you can use for uh, improving your focus sessions, like your study, study sessions. Um, this is the description that I extracted from the slides. So through the Meteor app, users can use straightforward effective reminders to efficiently finish their tasks, like studying or working. So through this app, you can, for example, set up the duration of your focus session. You can uh, set up some playlists some songs uh, for the focus sessions. You can schedule the focus session by selecting a given date. And you can also receive some motivational quotes, some motivational messages, either via notification probably or via voice. Um, and during a focus session, you can also browse some statistics. Uh, so for example, if during your focus session you are continuously uh, opening Facebook or Instagram on your phone, it's probably problem for your focus session um, and so you can browse this kind of, of statistics uh, and here you have probably some example of motivational quotes that can encourage you in continuing uh, successfully your, your study session for example. Um, so obviously you can test different things of this application in the lab or in the field. So for example what could you test in a lab study? for this, in your opinion, for this specific application? What are the aspects of the interaction between the users and this particular app that they can test with a lab study? Any idea? I can test probably, uh, I can try to find if there are any usability problems in the interaction between the user and this application. In other words, I can test if the user can successfully set up a session, for example, right? So something that is related to uh, the interaction that the user can perform on the app, right? So again, usability problems. But if I need to test the impact of this application on users, on the behavior of the users, can I test this impact in the lab? Probably no. I cannot ask the user to perform a focus session of three hours in the lab. Huh? It's, it's impractical, right? So when I need to really test the impact of the application of the solution and the behavior of the user, if this app is going to improve or not the focus sessions of the user, this is something that must be tested in, an in, in the wild, right? With an in the field uh, study. So for the effectiveness, for the impact of an application of a system in general, uh, you will probably need an in the wild test. Instead, when you are going to test the usability of your system, then a lab study is probably sufficient, right? So through lab and field studies, you can learn and test different aspects of the app and learn different things. Um, okay. Also inside the evaluations that involve the target population, you can have different approaches, of course. Um, so here is our first distinction. We'll focus on usability testing, but you can have also controlled experiments. There are two different things, two different approaches. And here I reported two sentences that try to describe the idea of these two different approaches. So for usability testing, the idea is, OK, let's find someone to use our app uh, so that we will get some feedback on how to improve it. Okay. So you give the app of your user and you ask your user to try the app and to give some feedback. So it's more about finding usability issues without too many constraints. Okay? 
and also without, without control, right? You give your app to your users and you ask them to try it. Uh, so it's mostly anecdotal and mostly driven by observation. Then, on the contrary, you can have uh, controlled experiments. And the idea is, here is, OK, we want to verify if users of our app perform a specific task faster, better, whatever you want, uh, with fewer errors, for example, than our competitor app. OK? So it's more scientific. Uh, it typically um, involves a comparison with another system and it's driven by an hypothesis. So my hypothesis is that my system is better than the other. Let's check if this is true. Okay? So it's more controlled, more scientific. Again, we are focusing on uh, user testing, usability testing. But let's spend some words about controlled experiments that we will not use in this course, but it's an important uh, and very popular approach in ACI. Um, through controlled experiments, you evaluate specific aspects of interactive behavior, and typically this is done in the lab, um, and you can provide empirical evidence to support a particular hypothesis. So the evaluator chooses an hypothesis to test, uh, and this hypothesis can be measured, can be assessed by measuring some attribute of the behavior of the participant with your system. So you have some metrics that you can collect, and these metrics can either uh, validate or not your hypothesis. And so the, the hypothesis is the prediction of the outcome of the study. So it's what we need to uh, demonstrate. And it's typically framed in terms of variables that are things to manipulate and measure to test the hypothesis again. And these hypotheses in HCI and in controlled experiments are typically framed as null hypotheses. Uh, so a null hypothesis it's, um, is a type of statistical hypothesis that proposes that there are no differences between groups of users or there are no relationships between variables. So if you can reject the null hypothesis, and we will see an example, this provides evidence, of course, for the alternative hypothesis. Uh, and the, uh, the alternative hypothesis is that there are differences. So an example of a null hypothesis for uh, the Metro app, the app that I've shown you before, is that, OK, by using the Metro app, uh, users are not able to improve their focus sessions. And if there are some improvements, these improvements are only by chance. They are not um, an improvement uh, by the app, but it's only by chance. So this is the null hypothesis. Obviously, if I can reject this hypothesis, this automatically means that the Metro app has an impact on the user. So if you reject the null hypothesis, you are demonstrating the effectiveness and the impact of your uh, application on, on users. So for example, in, in the case of the Metro app, what could be some variables to measure and test the null hypothesis? So the effectiveness of the app in improving some focus sessions of the users? Yeah, the amount of time spent focusing. How can you measure this amount of time? Yeah, we can look at the behavior of the user while using the app. So we should try to. Uh, find some metrics that we can measure uh, practically. Um, so an example could be, for example, the number of smartphone unlocks, maybe, or the minutes spent on a social network during a focus session. So if this amount of time is low, OK, it's, it's good. If, if the user is continuously using Facebook during a focus session, it's probably a problem, right? So you have to define a set of metrics, a set of variables that you can measure to test and 
hopefully reject the null hypothesis. Okay? And you can also have, you typically have uh, studies in which there is uh, a first week, let's say, of control. So we are going to um, measure these variables during the focus session of the user without the help of the application of the Metro app. And then you have one or two weeks of intervention. So we are measuring the same variables with the help of the app so that we can then compare, for example, if the uh, minutes on social networks is decreasing, this means that the app has an impact. Otherwise, uh, we can draw some other conclusions. So I have also another example from our research activities. Okay. So again, it's a research work in the field of trigger action programming, uh, Internet of Things, uh, and so a domain in which you can define automations connecting your different uh, devices and services connected to the Internet. And in this case, I think we developed a uh, Again, a recommender system of this kind of trigger action rules. So the user can start uh, defining his automation. And as long as he defines this automation, the tool is starting to provide some, some suggestions on how to automate the behavior of their uh, devices and services. Okay, so it's a recommender system of trigger action rules to which you can link the behavior of your uh, notifications, smart lamps, the temperature, and, and so on. So we conducted a controlled experiment and we measured different variables to understand if this uh, tool is effective or not in helping users to define this kind of automation. As you can see, we measured, we tested the tool with both experts in programming uh, with some technological skills and with non-experts. And we also compared the differences between the two populations in this case. And we made a comparison between if this then that, that is the, the control, it's the platform, the commercial platform that is used today and that is available on the web, and our tool that is named TAPREC. So we performed a comparison by measuring, in this case, the duration of the task. Yeah? Right? Yeah, it's a confidence interval. It's so Sorry? It is 95, Yeah, exactly. 95. Yeah, 95. It's the confidence interval. And you can perform some statistical analysis so in this case, we demonstrated that our tool made both experts and non-experts spend more time in the personalization scenarios. Uh, in this case, it's better if this time is higher uh, because in our opinion, the recommender system suggested more rules to be completed so the user enjoyed using the, the application for, for more time in this case, okay? Then we also measured, for example, the number of rules defined in a given session with, with the tool. Um, and we compared, again, the control platform, if it is then that, with our tool. So you can control, measure different things, and answer to different hypotheses. Okay? Let's go back to the slides, if I can. Okay. So these were controlled experiments. We will focus on usability testing uh, that are more easier, more easy, I would say. Um, this is the definition given by the Nielsen and Norman group about usability testing. They defined usability testing in this way. Uh, in a usability testing session, a researcher that is called the facilitator um, 
asks a participant to perform some tasks, uh, usually using one or more specific user interfaces. And while the participant completes each task, the researcher observes the participant behavior and listens for any, any feedback from the participant. So this is the definition by the Nielsen Norman group. Um, if you look on the web, uh, these kind of studies are also called sometimes user testing. Uh, but user testing, uh, however, may sound like researchers that are testing the participant, the user. And this is not true, of course. We never test the user, we test the application. And so this is the reason why it's probably better to use usability testing with respect to user testing. And the goal is here is probably threefold. The, the main goal is always identify usability problems in the design. Uh, but by running these studies, you can also uncover opportunities to improve. Okay, starting from the feedback of, of the participants. And the side aspect is that you also learn about the preferences and the typical behavior of your target populations, right? Because you have your target users that are using your system, you can observe them and you can extract what are their preferences and their uh, behaviors with your system. So it's a side aspect, but it's very important. And these are two figures uh, taken from the Nielsen Norman group that uh, shows the core elements of a usability testing and their relationship. Um, so first of all, we have the facilitator, uh, the researcher, the, resi the designer, uh, that guides the participant through the test process. Okay, so the facilitator, for example, gives the task to the user, answer to possible questions, guides the process of the participant. Then the other core element is our tasks, okay? Um, so during a usability testing, you ask participants to perform some, some tasks on the interface, and tasks are realistic activities that the participant might actually perform in real life, okay? We already have seen how to define tasks uh, before in this course. Uh, we are going to see how we can define tasks specifically designed for usability testing. And then obviously you have your participant that is a realistic user of the product or service that you are, that you are testing. So the facilitator uh, guides the process, gives instructions to the user, uh, the user performs some tasks, and the facilitator observes the behavior of the user and maybe ask some questions to get some, some feedback in a structured way. Okay, so let's focus on the three core elements. Facilitators, uh, again, uh, they guide the participant through the process. They give instruction, answer to the participant's question and ask follow-up questions. Um, and this is a very important point, however, uh, the facilitator should not influence, obviously, the behavior of the participant, okay? And this is the reason why, uh, sorry, can you make silence, please? Sorry, okay. Um, this is the reason why, uh, typically, the facilitator is not part of the design team. The facilitator should not know exactly how the system works, otherwise there is this risk of giving suggestions to the user on how to conclude, on how to perform the task, right? So obviously in our course, uh, you are going to take the role of facilitator, even if you know how your system works, but uh, generally, in theory, the facilitator should not know exactly how the system works. And also, um, before I said that the facilitator also observe the user uh, and try to extract feedback, but in general, you can also have dedicated figures serving as observers, okay? So, so that they can focus on observing participants, uh, like by taking notes, uh, without interacting with them. 
So typically, and also in this course, one of you will serve as a facilitator and the other members of the group will serve as observers, taking notes uh, and uh, about the behavior of the participants. So if you have uh, one member that is conducting the evaluation, the member will serve both as a facilitator and observer. But if you have uh, more members, you can also split uh, this. You can also have a facilitator and some observers. Then what about tasks? Um, we will see some more details on how to define tasks for usability testing, uh, I think, tomorrow. Uh, but tasks in usability tests are realistic activities that the participant might perform in real life. And here I reported two uh, examples of two tasks. The first one, for example, your printer is showing error with a given code. How can you get rid of the error message? You have a system with this error, and you must try to get rid of the, of the error. Another example, you are considering opening a new credit card with a given system. Please visit the website of the, of the company and decide which credit card you might want to open, if any. Another example of a realistic activity that uh, your user would like to perform on your system. Task instructions can be delivered to the participants verbally via voice, or also they can be written on a sheet of paper. And typically, you give to your participants one task at a time. Um, and if you are using a sheet of paper with all the tasks, the suggestion is to ask participants to read the tasks out loud so that you can understand if there are any misunderstandings, any problems before uh, asking users to perform the task. And the last core elements, the participants. Um, they are realistic users of the product or service being studied. Uh, so if you are testing a real product, uh, a system that is already uploaded on some Play stores or some digital stores, you can test your system with actual users of your product, right? So users that are already using your application. Otherwise, as in our case, we are testing a prototype. You can also select participants that have a similar background uh, to the target user group uh, or that have the, the same needs, right? So you, you define your target population and then you look for participants that have similar backgrounds to your envisioned target population. Um, so participants should represent the intended user community. Uh, but also in usability testing, within this target population, you can also vary some factors, right? Uh, so for example, again, I'm from the digital we've been topic, so uh, my examples are always uh, on this topic, but anyway, uh, we are testing an application, uh, a tool for helping users in reducing the time spent on social networks, okay? Some digital self-control tools. So you test this application uh, with some users that are really motivated in reducing the time they spend on social networks. And then you ask these participants, okay, did you appreciate the app? Did you like it? And the answer will be probably yes, right? And it's a positive answer, of course, but if you are also receiving these answers from some participants that, that don't have this strong motivation on the topic, the answer is probably stronger, right? And you can also try to generalize your findings. So if you can also vary some, some parameters, some, some, um, some characteristics of the users, with which you are uh, testing your app, it's better. Some, some characteristics in terms of background in computing and experience with the tasks, for example, uh, some characteristics about motivation, education, and, and so on. Okay? In this way, you can also try to generalize your findings. 
Otherwise, you can focus on very specific target populations with very specific motivation and skills, but then the suggestion is uh, do not try to generalize your results uh, because there is this risk that uh, results cannot be generalized to other populations. Okay? Then, another question. How many participants do you need? And here the magic number is always uh, five, okay? Um, as suggested by the Nielsen Norman group, if you want more details, you can follow the link. Um, so testing with five people lets you find uh, almost as many usability problems as you would find with more participants. And obviously, as we have seen in the previous lectures, testing costs increase uh, with each additional study participant, but after five participants, we, you will start, uh, you will see a lot of overlap. Uh, so the rule of thumb is, uh, if you have a big budget, you can obviously recruit many participants, but you should spend your budget on additional studies rather than uh, having more user, users in the same, in the same study. Okay, um, so the movement towards usability testing, that is a very popular approach in XCI right now, uh, stimulated also the building of uh, ad hoc laboratory studies, usability labs. Uh, obviously, you can perform also usability tests with, without a usability lab, for example, in this room, but usability labs are becoming popular. Um, and it's like in a police movie, right? You have two different rooms, the testing room and the observation room. And as in a police movie, uh, you are in the observation room, you see what happens in the testing room, uh, but the user cannot see you, okay? Um, the testing room is typically smaller uh, and accommodates a small number of people, typically the participant alone, as in the figure here. There is the participant that is trying probably something on the computer here. Uh, so in the testing room you have your participant with the equipment uh, necessary to conduct the study. And then there is the observation room that is typically larger. Uh, it can hold the facilitators, the observers, and you can have also some special equipment, uh, like here you have uh, some uh, software to see the user through a camera. You probably also have some software uh, that is mirroring uh, the screen of the participant so that you can see what the user is, is doing on your prototype. Uh, so you can have also some special equipment. And there are also different approaches for conducting usability testing. And first of all, you can have qualitative usability tests and quantitative usability tests. Um, so in qualitative testing, usability testing, you focus on collecting insights, findings, and and so on about how people use the product or service. So it's best for discovering problems in the user experience. So it's more related to the initial uh, idea, oh, sorry, to the initial idea with which I have introduced the concept, the, the, the technique. Then you can have also more quantitative usability tests uh, that focus on collecting metrics that describe the user experience. So the first one, qualitative usability testing, is more subjective. You, you collect the subjective feedback of your users. In the second one, you also try to measure something about the user experience with, with the tool. Um, and two of the metrics most commonly used and collect are task success and time on task. So for example, the time that the participant need to complete, to complete the task. Obviously, you can mix the two approaches. You can have a single usability testing 
uh, session in which you collect both subjective feedback and you measure something about the experience of the user. Uh, then you can conduct usability testing either in person or remotely. Uh, for remote studies, you can, for example, set up uh, a Zoom call. And in this case, uh, you conduct the study as you would conduct it in person. But there is also the alternative of using some automatic tool for uh, usability testing. Uh, so you ask your user to perform the, ta the test on his or her own without the help of a facilitator. So everything is uh, automatic. Okay, any questions on this long introduction? Okay, so let's start exploring the three main steps to conduct a usability test. Um, and again, the most important one is, is the first one, uh, that is planning the test. Uh, so you should ask yourself, uh, what, what do I need to conduct the test? What equipment? Uh, who are my participants? How can I recruit them? Uh, and what are you going to test? Where and how? So, Everything should be prepared, including the equipment, the prototype, the room, before starting the first session with your first participant. And you typically produce a document describing the, the planning of your, of your usability test. And this will be uh, also an exercise for the next week. Then you have the second step, that is the long but easy step. So if you planned everything carefully, then the run phase, it's really easy to conduct. So you have one participant at a time that is trying your system, trying to perform the tasks that you define. So first participant, 30 minutes, okay, the test is finished. You start with the second participant that will perform the very same steps in the evaluation, okay? And during the running phase, you can obviously collect data, subjective data, like uh, open-ended questions at the end of the test. But you can also measure some metrics. So, for example, how many times the participant click on a given button? Or what about the time spent for completing the task? Some, some metrics to be measured. And as we will see later, uh, you can also collect these metrics automatically, okay? So, you deliberately insert in your code some portion of your code that automatically collects this kind of metrics, like the time spent for completing the task. So we'll probably remove this, this code in production, but this code is extremely useful to speed up this process of collecting metrics, okay? Without measuring the time, for example, manually. And finally, there, there is the last step, analyze. So you put all together and you try to extract information from the collected data. So you analyze the answers of your participants, you compute some averages of the time spent, for example, um, and so on. You produce some charts, some graphs, you, and you try to understand uh, the results of your, of your study. So let's focus on, on planning. Uh, again, the most important part of usability testing. You cannot start a usability test without planning it. Um, okay, so let's explore this phase in more, in more de with more details. And I listed a set of uh, points that you should consider in this, in this phase. So first of all, you should um, focus on your participants. Uh, you already know how to recruit uh, some users from your target population. You have re already recruited some target users in the need finding process. Uh, but first of all, you should define what is your target population, right? So you should choose who you will involve in the test and who are your target, your target users. Then, how many participants do we need? Again, five, it's, it's enough. 
So if you have 10 participants, uh, it's probably better having two rounds of your usability testing. So you test your prototype, your system with five participants, you discover some problems, you fix these problems, and then you re-perform the study with the other five participants. It's better than having 10 participants in a single study. And then you must decide who and which roles you are going to play. Okay? So you need at least a facilitator in the session. Uh, so someone that guides the user through the, through the process by giving them the tasks, by answering questions. And then other two people, for example, may serve as note takers and, and observers. Again, you can develop some software to collect some metrics automatically but you should always have someone taking notes during the session. And again, this is a very important point that we are not going to respect in this course, but anyway, developers, designers, creators of the interactive system uh, should not serve as facilitators. Because if it's my app, I know uh, how my app works, and there is the risk to give suggestions that can bias the results. Then you should focus on tasks. So you should define a set of tasks that you are going to ask your participants to perform. Um, in usability testing, uh, tasks may be introduced with a scenario, and we will see an example right now. And they must be concrete and with a clear goal. Um, how many tasks? Typically, you ask your participants to uh, perform five, ten tasks during a session of a usability test. OK? Um, so for example, let me open uh, again an example extracted from our research activities, always in the same domain. In this case, we developed and tested, let me see if I can find the example, uh, a conversational agent to define the same automations of before. Okay, so in this case, instead of using a form filling procedure with some recommendations, users can directly ask a chatbot uh, with a higher level of abstraction to define some automation. Okay, so the user is interacting with the chatbot in natural language by specifying some abstract intentions, like, I don't know if you can see it, like increasing the temperature in a room. So in natural language, and the tool then gives, again, some suggestions that match the intention, the abstract intention of the user, okay? So the user interacts in natural language, and then, you have, and then the user has simply to click on a suggested rule. And for testing this, um, this tool, we define some uh, tasks, and this is an example if I can open it, okay. It's an example of a task. As you can see, there is a scenario that is describing a fictional user, John, uh, with some characteristics of John. John is a lawyer and a tech enthusiast. Uh, and then there is also the description of all the devices that are installed in the home of John and all the services that John typically uses. On, on these devices like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And there is also a set of rules that John has already defined in the system. So the scenario describing the user with all his characteristics and devices and so on. So it's very concrete. Um, and then there is a goal. So by using the tool, John would like to personalize their services for supporting his free time activities. So the participant can impersonate John, can try to understand the scenario, and then can try to perform the task that has a clear goal on, on the platform. Okay? And we also provide the user with some 
uh, visual representation of the context in, the, in this case of the scenario with the different environments in which John can interact with devices and, and services. Okay, besides defining these tasks, you should also define some uh, criteria to understand if the task has been completed successfully or not, right? And as we will see, I think tomorrow, you can adopt different approaches. Uh, you can have a binary metric, for example, uh, to understand, okay, the task has been completed successfully or the task has not been completed, so two levels. Um, or you can also have multiple levels, uh, multiple criteria, right? So you should be able to understand if a task has been completed successfully or not and the degree of success, right? So in, in the example of before, uh, a task was successfully completed after, I don't remember, probably uh, five, uh, five rules, right? After the definition of five rules, okay? So if, when the user uh, clicked on the fifth rules, the task was considered finished. And finally, you should also, not finally, probably, yes. You can also decide which methodology you are going to adopt during the usability testing. Uh, so during a usability test, you can adopt different methodologies. We will focus mainly on think aloud and cooperative evaluation. Um, uh, more details will, will follow. Um, but anyway, you can ask your participants to perform a task with a given methodology, okay? So for example, with Think Aloud, you are asking participants uh, to perform the task and while performing the task, the participants should comment out loud what is doing uh, on the interface, okay, verbally. Um, so you must also decide in this planning phase which methodology, if any, you are going to adopt um, and for which tasks. Maybe for some task you don't adopt any particular methodology, you just ask your participant to perform the task, that's it. For other tasks, you may be interested in receiving more feedback, so you ask your participants, for example, to use a think aloud methodology. You can also plan if you need or want to ask any additional information. So the building block, let's say, of usability testing is the user performing the task, but then you can also ask additional information to the user. For example, you can ask information before the test, and this is typically the case uh, of background and demographic information. You typically have an initial questionnaire for your participant, uh, asking the participant the age, uh, the background, the skills on computers, technologies, and, and so on. Some background demographic information. You can also ask additional information after the test, so when the session is finished. And here you typically ask something about the app and the experience of the user with the app. Um, so, for example, on a scale from 1 to 5, how would you rate the usability of the system that you have tried uh, today? You can also have, this is more rare, but you can have also some questionnaires, some questions uh, before and after each task uh, or before and after a meaningful group of tasks. So when you are preparing your tasks, you may want to define some tasks that are very similar and some other tasks that explore another aspect of your, of your system. So tasks can be divided in categories, let's say, and you can ask additional information before and after uh, each group of tasks. Um, and you can have different uh, 
uh, tools to collect this kind of feedback, this kind of additional, ad additional information. Then you have also to select which equipment you will need. Um, also with respect to the criteria and methodology you define. Uh, so we are going to test a prototype. It's a medium fidelity prototype. In your case, you, in Figma, so you will need for sure a computer uh, on which you can test, you can ask your participants to test your prototype, for example. But if you are using the think aloud methodology, so the user that speak while he is performing the task, you probably need some hardware and some software to audio record the, the participant uh, information, right? And so you need some more equipment. And finally, it's finally, no, it's not finally, uh, you should also prepare an informed consent form. It's very important for participants to fill. Uh, so it's a consent form uh, in which you explain to the participant how, we are, how you are going to conduct the study, which data you are going to collect, which rights as the user during the study. And if the participant doesn't sign the informed consent, you cannot do the usability test with, with this participant. You must try with another one, okay? So if you don't have a signed informed consent form, uh, you don't have the permission to collect any data about the participant. Okay, finally, um, you can also plan to have a debriefing session at the end of the test uh, for each participant, for some participants, uh, to collect some more feedback from, from the user. Here you typically ask some open-ended questions about your system, about your app. Um, so observers and note takers can ask general and specific questions to better understand uh, how the test has been performed. Then the last uh, part of this planning phase is developing a written test protocol, the so-called script. And this is also very, very important. Uh, and we suggest you to uh, develop a script also for your usability testing that you are going to perform in assignment six. Uh, it's important for consistency among sessions. Um, by having a script and by following this script during your studies, uh, every participant will receive the very same instructions uh, and information in the same order. So it's a way to avoid introducing biases in your studies and in your results. And this script uh, typically contains a step by step, uh, the step by step instructions with all the needed questions and forms, uh, questions to be answered to your users, to your participants. Uh, and often the script also includes the exact words and sentences that you are going to use with your participants. So when you running a usability study is very easy because you have simply to read your script in front of your participant. Okay? So it's to, for consistency among sessions. And you should practice this script with your friends or colleagues to fix bugs and any possible misunderstandings before starting uh, with, the first, uh, with the first participant. Okay, so this was a very long introduction to the planning phase with some important points that you should consider. And today and tomorrow we will see some details on some of these steps. A and the first important thing, it is mandatory, it's the informed consent form. So again, it's a form through which the user is informed on which information you are going to collect and which rights the participant has during the study. And on the one hand, it's a good ethical practice, but on the other hand, it's also uh, mandatory uh, due to some regulations like GDPR in Europe. So it's not only a good practice, 
sometimes is, it's also mandatory for running studies with uh, real users, with your target population. And here I listed the five uh, items that should always be present in an informed consent form. So first of all, uh, I have freely volunteered to participate in the experiment. Uh, this may seem obvious, at least uh, in, in XCI studies, uh, right? So we don't go to the participant home with a gun asking the participant to participate in the study. But it's less obvious in other domains like the medical domain. So it's important to include this, this sentence. Then second uh, item, I have been informed in advance what my tasks will be and what procedures will be, will be followed. So it's an informed form, so you should describe your study in the form. Then, um, I've been given the opportunity to ask questions and have had my question answered to my satisfaction. So before starting the test, probably the participant will ask you some, some questions and you obviously must answer these, these questions. I'm aware that I have the right to withdraw consent and to discontinue participation at any time uh, without prejudice to my future treatment. So the user can stop the study uh, at, at any time. It's a right for, for the user. And the last point is my signature below may be taken as affirmation of all the above statements. It was given prior to my participation in this study. So the user must sign the document before starting the session, okay? You can use this as a template for your, for your consent form uh, in assignment six. Um, then these are the basic item. Then if you are, for example, video recording the session, you, you will need to add some more sentences here to this form, like some sentences about privacy, for example, okay? So these are only the, the basic items. Okay. Okay. Uh, just to introduce the first topic of tomorrow, we are going to explore uh, in more details how we can define tasks uh, for usability testing, and we will see also some some examples. Um, so here we are interested in defining tasks according to the main goals of the users with our system. So we start from the main goals that we envision from, for our systems to define these tasks that will be performed by our users. And a suggestion here is that rather than simply ordering test users to, to do a given operation with no explanation, it's better to, uh, again, use a short scenario to better situate the request. Uh, so we are also going to explain why the user uh, is doing a given operation. So a scenario, as we have seen in the example, uh, need to provide the context, uh, typically of a fictional users, uh, of a fictional user, so that the participant can engage with the interface by impersonating the, this user, uh, pretending to perform the task as uh, if, if she or he were at home, was at home or in the office, okay? Okay, then tasks must be realistic and actionable, but I think that we can stop here for, for today and we will continue um, these slides tomorrow, okay? Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, any particular questions also about your projects, I'm here for the next five, 10 minutes. <laughs>